Today I'm speaking with Lucian Greaves. Lucian is a co-founder of the Satanic Temple, which in my view is easily the most interesting religious organization that's active today. So I'm very happy to have you on the show. Uh, Lucian, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So I want to talk a little bit today about how, in my view, Satanism is a bit of a futurist project. I want to get there in this interview. I don't want to start there necessarily, but uh, I have, I've written about this a little bit, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on that and to see if you have any strong opinions about various futurist topics. I think that could be fun to get into. But uh, first, I feel like most people who might be watching this are probably pretty familiar about your organization, but I just want to start by asking, what is the pitch for why someone should join the Satanic Temple or donate to the cause? Well, as far as donate to the cause, I think, you know, we're really on the front line of fighting and defending pluralism and government viewpoint neutrality. The question is to whether or not people are prepared for religious encroachments into public spaces always seems to take a completely new resonance for them when we step in and say, if you are going to represent one religion, you're also going to have to have Satanists here as well. Uh, that that really agitates a lot of people and makes them think about these issues a whole lot differently, uh, sometimes in not the most appropriate ways that we would have hoped they would approach these issues, and oftentimes in a very hypocritical way. But uh, it really does frame the conversation differently, and we've been leveraging religious liberty laws in defense of our own values, which are oftentimes the polar opposite of the ones being espoused by people who are fighting to uh, to have their religious liberty work in another direction against everybody else. So that's for donating. But as for joining, that's not a pitch I make to people. Uh, if people find it, they like it, they identify with it, then they should, they, they are welcome to join with us, but we don't proselytize. And we also uh, like to be clear that we are fine with religious pluralism. We're fine with religious diversity. Sometimes this kind of iconography, this whole construct, uh, people's ethical values might be the same as ours, but the satanic angle just doesn't work for them. It has no meaning. And that's fine. They, they, they shouldn't join. And we're not going to try to convince them that they should. And we don't really want to grow our numbers like that in a way where we have this ubiquitous understanding that ours is the only way to go. We actually believe in a viewpoint pluralism that actually helps people uh, manage their disagreements together, learn all sides of a controversy or issue, and grow from that rather than this, this dead dogma of unified consensus. So in my mind, the Satanic Temple, in terms of its activism that it does, free speech and separation of church and state, in my mind, it's it's pretty similar to activities of the ACLU or FIRE, organizations like that. How do you see the Satanic Temple fitting in with the whole that that world of, let's say someone has 100 bucks to donate to one of these causes and they, they want it to go towards the separation of church and state? Where where would that money best be slotted or where is it most needed, let's say? And and I mean, this is so fascinating to me in that it seems like y you guys will do some crazy thing. Like, I mean, not crazy, but like put a Baphomet next to the Ten Commandments on a church and then the ACLU comes in to defend you, for example. But like, y you know, where along those lines would a donation of, say, $100 make the most benefit to keep pushing against, let's say, Christian nationalists or people who are trying to impose a state religion? Well, oftentimes we don't have the pro bono support of an organization like the ACLU or the Freedom From Religion Foundation. So I guess when people are donating, they have to prioritize the approach that they think is going to work best. Uh, for instance, we enjoined a lawsuit with the ACLU and the Freedom From Religion Foundation in Arkansas where Arkansas placed a Ten Commandments monument on the Capitol grounds, the ACLU and Freedom from Religion Foundation were saying, this is an establishment clause violation. The, the monument needs to come down. Our argument was different. We were saying, well, if you're going to keep the Ten Commandments monument there, you also have to leave those Capitol grounds open for the monument we would donate. And we have a monument built and we're ready to donate it to 
Arkansas. They said no, and we're in litigation now. They combine these lawsuits together because so many of the facts are the same, but our approach is a bit different. Like you can give your money to Planned Parenthood, but Planned Parenthood doesn't necessarily right now have an approach in which they can claim some kind of exemption for their abortion facilities. We're working to open our second abortion facility right now. And the idea is, is that we are going to fight to declare, regardless of state laws or prohibitions against abortion, that we have a religious right to exercise our abortion ritual. So it's an entirely different legal terrain. And in some cases, we're the only ones who will have that standing to be a religious organization claiming deeply held belief and protected by religious liberty laws, whereas some of the other organizations don't have that benefit. And I feel like, I mean, that kind of gets into a deeper topic, too, of how unjust I think that is as well. But I think that's something atheists have traditionally in recent times done to themselves is make unavailable to them arguments from religious liberty by constantly decrying anything labeled religion. I think optimally our religious liberty is meant to protect items of religious opinion in that nobody's superstition should have them with elevated civic capacities over anybody else. So when they try to discredit the Satanic Temple as a religious group, I think it's a shame that anybody thinks that carries any weight or that we're in a position where it does at this point, because I feel like non-believer groups, atheist groups, groups that don't declare even a particular set of ethical values, but just a non-belief, should also have equal rights to viewpoint representation in any public forum. But the fact is that it is that now, as a protected class, religion seems to have gained this elevated status, and that's something that we have, even if we have less resources than some of those other groups. Sometimes those resources can be better focused towards uh, at least new terrain and in legal argumentation, if not if not really safe terrain or a uh, or a sure uh, a certain win. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about that for a minute, the religious element here. So the Satanic Temple is an atheist organization, effectively, in that you don't advocate for or you don't espouse like a, a literal Satan, right, that you're you're worshiping necessarily. Uh, and I mean, being an atheist organization, this is so interesting to me because I have you know, a lot of atheist friends. I'm in those circles. And there's a big discussion going on today about how, you know, has the new the new atheism movement failed? Are people, you know, experiencing a void in their lives because they no longer are tied to traditional religions? Does the satanic temple fill some of that void? Let's just say there is such a void. I don't necessarily think there is, but like, is if there is, like, does the satanic temple fill some of that void? I mean, I know that there's a social component involved and maybe some, I'm not sure. Maybe you could describe that for me. I think they're, from speaking with various people who joined up with the Satanic Temple, joined our congregations and have been involved, I feel that for a lot of people, there is a sense of loss when they feel like they don't belong to any type of religious community. There are a lot of people in the Satanic Temple for whom religion was an important component of their lives growing up. And a lot of them may feel, may feel exploited by the traditional religious communities they were in. But also, that was their sense of community. That was their support group, and that really contextualized and framed their their ethics and their their viewpoints for them. So that loss was tremendous, and they thought that, that would never be available to them again. And for some people, that ritual component is huge also. And people have it in their minds that if a ritual is lacking in, in uh, some supernatural basis, that there's no need to engage with it. And I think that's just a very basic mindset that ignores the importance of birthdays, funerals, weddings. I mean, those are rituals we all engage in and see the value in, even though we know we're not appealing to some outside ethereal consciousness when we do it. And there's a lot of ritual activities that our, our congregations do, and there's really all that sense of community you would expect from any type of 
religious congregation or or community. And a lot of people are very grateful that they have that in their lives. And a lot of people never had that in their lives, and they find that with the Satanic Temple now. So I think it's it's different for people. I've, I've spoken to a lot of atheists, too, for whom they don't feel that sense of loss. They don't feel that they're missing anything with, uh, with uh, being an atheist community that isn't uh, bound to an iconography or some kind of mythological construct. But I think ultimately, as time passes and there's more detached uh, research done by sociologists, uh, new religion scholars and others, my I anticipate that there will be a real benefit to non-theistic religion. This notion that you can take mythology, you can take iconography, you can construct things in this way in your mind, in a constructive way, where you're not self-deceiving, where you're not uh, where you're not just putting uh, thought-stopping dogmas in your mind, but you're actually broadening your capacity to map a whole framework of your world differently to make your your problem-solving skills even better. And I think this idea that non-theistic religion, especially in our case, is just a way of saying that we're non-religious and that we're mocking religion is not just a convenient way of looking at things, but it's a really unsophisticated way of looking at things. And I, and it's honestly not the truth. A lot of people look at us and think that the Satanism aspect of it is entirely uh, done in a prankster fashion, uh, something that's made just to be provocative to the people for whom this is provocative. But for a lot of people who are involved in it, you know, even though we don't take a superstitious angle on it, all of it is emblematic of their freedom from superstition. And for a lot of people coming away from that was something more or less of a transcendental experience to, for lack of better wording on it. And it's something that really affected them and will never leave and has that kind of uh, religious grasp upon their consciousness that will never really go away. And I think that's just one of those things that I can try to explain and people either get it or they don't, but that also speaks to why I don't uh, try proselytizing and convincing people that it's for them because I've seen so often that the people for whom this makes sense and it works, it doesn't usually take a whole lot of convincing. It's not that mysterious to them. And for some of the people for whom it's very confusing and mysterious from the start, they, they'll probably never come around, but that's okay. I just wish they wouldn't assume that our experience is the same as theirs in every case and that we're being disingenuous if they were saying it's something otherwise. How important is that element of being provocative? I know that going back in history, there are other versions of Satan that sometimes were more comedic. I think maybe during the Dark Ages or something, there was a, a comedic Satan that popped up in plays, for example. Are there are there Satanists who play with that image of Satan and maybe have like a lighter version of it and and maybe not but like if so would that kind of like go against the provocativeness of the organization? No, it's it's interesting. There's there's a spectrum of the relationship with satanic iconography that's a, a wide spectrum even within a, any individual group of Satanists within the Satanic Temple. You'll see. Uh, an attachment to little Baphomet plushy dolls, you know, the, the okay, yeah. character with the inverted pentagram and, you know, that really kind of benign, happy imagery. And then there's, you know, also the darker horror aesthetic. And I think it, uh, it's, it's a matter of taste. It's a matter of uh, mood maybe at the moment, but it, there's a really diverse demographics now um, amongst uh, Satanists, at least within the Satanic Temple, where there there is that real broad spectrum, and we allow for that kind of creativity, and it's always supposed to be a continuing dialogue, you know, this, this entire thing. Um, we built it into our tenets that this science is the arbiter of truth claims, and that, you know, n none of these uh, precepts of ours are supposed to be written in stone, but that we are able to change our viewpoints with the best available evidence. And I think that kind of permeates everything we do. Even our ritual constructs are basic frameworks, essentially, of what this is supposed to convey. 
And then there's a lot of creative latitude, depending on who's doing it at the time. And in that way, you can see how the fundamental philosophies change the very behavior in more traditional religions where they're very much for uh, authoritarian conditioning. There is no there is no flexibility on those uh, on those rituals. There'll be rote uh, procedures that are meant to be memorized scripts, and it doesn't matter if what they're muttering is understood by them or not. Just the fidelity to the original source, and that's you know. So I think I think everything in our culture kind of conveys that uh, that more of an open system than than what tra traditional religions are typically about. Okay, I like that. And now that I'm thinking about it, a Satan plushie is probably just as terrifying to like a Fox News conservative Christian as as a Baphomet. There's it's kind of like another layer of being scary to them, I imagine. Oh yeah, um, that's, that's the thing. Well, people ask about it, does this kind of exposure defang the whole thing? But you'll be amazed at how benign certain things can be, and it just doesn't matter. When we first uh, started out, one of the earlier things we did was we asked for placement of our literature in a in a passive uh, distribution of, of Bibles in schools in Florida, where they had allowed school districts to open up these schools to set up like a forum in their cafeteria or whatever, where different organizations set up tables. And there was uh, there, there was a religious organization there proselytizing with with Bibles and different evangelical uh, distribution materials. So we said, fine, okay, we, we'll, we'll take a table too. And uh, we put together an activity book and you can still find the activity book online. It was only like nine pages. There's uh, a segment for coloring some pictures. There's, uh, there's just little puzzles and entirely benign with happy little pictures and pro-social messages, uh, satanic symbols, but there was a complete meltdown and they ended up closing the forum entirely. And it's, it's comical when you see the materials. Uh, there was nothing objectionable about them unless you really do have a superstitious attachment to this idea that the satanic iconography will summon ill demons or whatever. But that was that was essentially what we ran into. So. Sometimes the most benign things invoke the most terrified fear in people. I probably saw this past uh, Christmas season. There was uh, our Iowa congregation set up a display in uh, the Capitol Rotunda in Iowa. And that was just another really benign display. If you weren't uh, aware that it was satanic, it probably wouldn't really catch your attention but it really captured the imagination of people over there. And some guy, the failed politician from Mississippi, drove over to the Capitol grounds just to tear it down. And, you know, it's so it, it really after at the point where you're the satanic temple, there's not a whole lot you can do in presentation and other ways to to get people to to accept uh, to accept anything you do, regardless of what it is. I have watched the video of the uh, the after school program that's on your website, and it is a delightful, catchy little tune. It, it's it's very well put together. So, uh, no, yeah, it's, it's that's very interesting. And and the thing that I like about the Satanic Temple is it it it's not like it's kind of you know benign on the surface, and then like there's this actual like horrible underbelly. Like it's all like actually great, you know, kind of enlightenment values pro-science stuff all the way down from what I can tell, um, which actually, that's going to be my little segue into talking about transhumanism. Um, some some questions along these lines, kind of, kind of futuristy questions for you. Um, I wrote a couple of years ago an article just on Medium, and it was called Satanic Transhumanism, the Future of Reason. And this is like, for some reason, has become my most popular medium post ever. Not that not that it's gotten like a lot of attention, but like every week it gets a couple hundred views, you know, for, for some reason. Most of my stuff on Medium like doesn't get views anymore. So uh, someone is out there reading about satanic transhumanism, and I get comments on this every now and then. Uh, the pitch for this, and I want to get your thoughts, is that transhumanism 
the idea effectively that through science we're going to transcend our bodies and effectively become gods at some level or become post-human. It has its roots in a fairly, you know, satanic place. Uh, you know, it kind of dates back to uh, Zoroastrianism, which is like God isn't going to solve our problems; we're going to solve our, solve our own problems. Uh, there's like the Prometheus myth that's kind of part of this too, stealing fire from the gods to uh, become immortals ourselves. And then up into the present day, there was uh, Jack Parsons, who also was, he was part of the, the OTO, uh, the, the Lima version of, of, I guess, Satanism. Um, and he was a huge transhumanist, like a major figure in early transhumanism. And even today, interestingly, uh, Max Moore, who is affiliated with Alcor and uh, Humanity Plus, he's written quite a bit about uh, Satanism himself, about how the idea that Lucifer was the light bringer and is anti-authoritarian and says, you know, on your own, you are going to solve your problems. And that is the symbolism that you can layer on top of like a pro-science view. It effectively is very you guys. It's, it's very, it's very, very you know, what you guys do and kind of my, how I tie this together about how white satanic transhumanism might be the future of reason is the idea that transhumanism does inherently have religious undertones to it because we're trying to overcome death, right? That's like the, the idea through science, overcome death. And because it's kind of, kind of sort of religious, it is just asking to have some sort of layer of symbolism. And as you say, iconography layered on top of it. And, but it effectively the argument would be, you don't have to go out and create new iconography. It's already there. It just happens to be Satanism. That happens to be the iconography that perfectly maps onto this world of transhumanism. What are your thoughts on that? No, I think that that, that works. I think Satanism will take on different forms throughout time because Satanism for a long time has been this kind of pejorative construct that something that was attributed to other people, but it's got such a long lineage of uh, being this concept of the contrary to this kind of uh, uh, universal dictatorship that we're told we're supposed to be under, that it, it, it's kind of mystifying to me how often people ask, well, why, why Satan? Why Satanism? Why couldn't you call it something else? As though it could really be as arbitrary as that for us, that we could just make up a character and go to the focus group. And, you know, that's just, it's not how it works, regardless of whether we believe in an actual supernatural Satan or not. That's kind of the religious raw material that we were given. And I think there is something that's going to be fundamental about those things that are imprinted upon you at a very early age. And I think once you have those kinds of heuristics in your mind, certain things are just naturally going to flow there in these kinds of categories. And I think transhumanism is one of those things. And I also think that when people see the extreme overreach now of what I think it can rightly be called a theocratic coup in the United States and more broadly worldwide, to a lot of people, that there's a lot of natural intuitive sense to where Satanists could fit in on that battle. And that's done nothing but benefit the Satanic Temple in modern times. I think had we come around, you know, several decades earlier, we might have seen far more of an anomaly and, you know, it wouldn't have been as intuitive to people as to what, why they would have an interest in joining. But an interesting data point is that in 2016, right after Trump was elected, a lot of people signed up with membership with us, uh, signed on. And of course, the question is, is that just a reaction to the politics? And, you know, are they going to, is that going to have any lasting effect on them? Are people going to stick with this? Or is that just a kind of a culture war thing to proclaim, put on their social media for the moment, you know, the day after, and then forget about it? You never really know with these kinds of things. And, you know, we still don't to a large degree. We haven't been able to really do our own kind of sociological research on the satanic and who would trust our results if we did. But I can say that 
we've never really dropped in numbers since then. We've always just been experiencing this kind of exponential growth and even more so when there's that, when there's really egregious theocratic overreach, when Roe versus Wade is overturned or when, you know, they're trying to pass bills to put Ten Commandments monuments on all the public grounds or bring chaplains into schools and people realize the fights that were in there. It wakes people up to who we are, but it also seems to have a real staying power too. And I think, you know, a lot of people, if they've got this kind of basic construct in their mind, where at the core of it, there's these kinds of dueling ideologies that are fairly flexible in a lot of ways, but you're going to fall on one or the other, where you have the left-hand path or the right-hand path, the path of conformity or the one of uh, of inquiry, regardless of where it leads. You know, you're, you're going to have people, I think, in some cases, naturally ascribing their transhumanist beliefs to Satanism, whether it's non-theistic or whatever. I just, I mean, I, I, that gets me back to the whole non-theistic thing and the value in it. But I think people would get there regardless of whether we were doing it or not. And it's something that exists and is legitimate regardless of the fact that we're able to utilize our religious status as standing in courts as well. Mm -hmm. Where are you on some of these projects, for example, overcoming death through science or just the longevity movement in general? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about it. Uh, I, I, I love to see progress in that regard. I don't think uh, I necessarily have a motivation towards immortality, though. Uh, you know, I might I might be willing to tack on 100 years or so, but the idea of eternity sounds horrific to me. <laughs> How about uh, uploading your mind to the cloud or having some sort of a brain implant so that you're 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 connected to, to a machine like the cyborg view? Yeah, but then you get into those philosophical questions about is that really you? You know, like there's that whole thought experiment about uh, tr transmitting uh, yourself through a teleporter, Star Trek style. And it disassembles you, takes a clear map of everything, and then reassembles uh, the whole molecular structure at a different point. And is it just some organism that has your memories intact? that uh, popped up in a different place, it, whereas you actually died, or is it uh, is it legitimately to be just considered you? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it is you, but in reality, did your consciousness die, and then there's a replica? And, you know, the question becomes complicated. Like, say you became disassembled molecularly, it uh, mapped you out, and then... Uh, something went wrong and it reassembled you in the one pod, but also reassembled the molecular facsimile of you somewhere else. Well, which one is you or are you both you kind of thing? And anyways, that's just my long way of saying that at the end of the day, I think you can't really replicate your consciousness in a computer and have it be you. It's always going to be just a copy of you. So I think some of these efforts might be futile insofar as actual immortality is concerned. But um, if your interest is in keeping effects similarly of your consciousness alive and keeping your uh, opinions part of the dialogue or whatever, I mean, it, it's not to say any of that is uh, is a pointless endeavor. Yeah, excellent points. I think that all of that is very well taken. My rebuttal to that tends to be the idea that Yes, all of this is absurd and you might be destroying yourself, but I like to look at this from the other way around. What if we started as machines and then we're, you know, you know, merging into biological life forms? It would be just as absurd. Like the idea that we, let's say we were machines, we'd be like, wait, but you, you could be born as a twin. Like, what the hell is that? Like, how, how could you be like, that's, that's insane to be like a twin. Or you could be born with like all these weird diseases that we can get. Everything is kind of absurd when you're talking about consciousness because like we still don't understand it. But that's I, I like to draw that parallel. Like how absurd is this like destroying your body and then recreating it as a machine versus like if we were to do that the other way around. Equally absurd, but we like just accept the fact that our lives already are utterly absurd. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the arguments uh, regarding AI. And I do see a lot of 
what I think is undue panic about AI, but I also see what I think are, uh, is misplaced panic, where panic might be uh, more appropriate in other directions. But I often see these arguments about, well, you know, a, a, a conscious artificial intelligence isn't going to need to conquer us or do any of these things that we uh, fear they might do because they won't have the same motivations as us. And I feel like they're already getting ahead of themselves because they might, because I think after a while, the, the most sensible thing for the designers to do will be, and they already do this, is design these things off of biological models. So they might find that they want to uh, motivate these things one way or another, try to put more, you know, instinctive responses in, I, I don't know, we just don't know what, what direction they'll take this. So I think it's too early to say, well, that wouldn't happen because uh, it it very well might if it happens in the biological world that they'll try replicating it in the in the scientific realm just to just to have greater insights even as to, to how we developed and evolved. There's a big battle right now between the doomers and the tech optimists. The doomers saying that one way or the other, we're basically going to destroy ourselves. And also on that side is the fact that like no one's really procreating anymore. There's an epidemic of loneliness or basically you get a cell phone and you get more depressed, especially if you're a teen girl. I mean, like, and then on the tech optimist side, it's more the idea that, I mean, in my view, everything is we've been there, done that without tech. So we just need to like, we're in the infancy of technology and it's gonna absolutely fuck things up, but we need to like start getting used to it because it ain't going away, that sort of thing. And also just like, you know, you can have a litany of reasons why technology has made life better in so many ways. I work from home, you know, it's not too bad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like where do you fall on that line of being a tech optimist, optimist versus a doomer? You know, it's a, it depends on the day, and it depends on what I, what I see happening. I, on the for the most part, I've been a, a tech optimist until more recently. I think there has been a, a horrific failure to think some of these things through. I, I honestly thought rolling out Chat GPT as a search engine was one of the dumbest things they could have done with that AI technology. I thought the idea of having kind of a single conversational answer to any question put into a search engine sounded uh, sounded awful. It sounded like it could only uh, uh, hyperdrive the problems we have with social media now, people's kinds of information bubbles and tribalization, polarization. And I was wondering what they were going to do about the notion of personalized responses from uh, a chat GPT engine. Uh, it was somebody searching for answers, there's often many answers to any given question and how is it going to summarize that and do justice to all of that or was it going to start boiling down to as i said personalized responses to people which further drives their polarization and inability to think outside of that but they rolled it out without thinking of the legal implications either because i thought well there must have been teams of lawyers trying to figure out what they do if this if you look up an individual and the chat GPT slanders them based on erroneous material, it's scraped from somewhere else. And now it's given as like the answer from God, you know, as, but anyways, then I saw that they were having lawsuits and things that were similar to these cases that I thought would have been easily thought about in advance, but seemed underexplored in their rush to get it out to market. And that was when I actually got a little worried about, about, I think, the overall regulatory stupidity and complete lack of awareness on the part of our politicians. We already saw that when they do those kinds of show trials they have against social media, where they sit, uh, you know, uh, Zuckerberg and the head of Apple and all these guys in a room, and then they start berating them for following the rules to their natural conclusion and not acting as though they're regulated in ways they're not, which would only put them at a disadvantage and is kind of impossible to ask of them to begin with. So, but they, they keep doing that and they don't have a sensible system of regulation in place yet. And I do think that is, is cause for concern. But I, that said, I do think there are ways that can be mitigated. 
in that we don't want to get uh, overly rambunctious with uh, regulatory zeal either. And we really do need to allow the maximum potential space for innovation and progress if we want to solve the problems we have, like climate change and, and other things that demand scientific solutions. Yeah, I am so worried about polarization and misinformation, uh, especially during an election cycle. I think it's going to be kind of nuts when we are going to the polls this fall to vote for the new the new president, uh, whoever that happened to might be. It's I mean, I'm I'm terrified about it. And I mean, do you do you have any thoughts about like the, the issue of polarization in this country? And and I mean, does the Satanic Temple try to do anything to mitigate any of that? That's really been a primary focus of mine for a while. And, you know, we started our organization, I think, just at the wrong time for that kind of concern. We, at the right time for people to understand intuitively where we fall in the war against theocrats and what Satanism could mean in a positive way, as I spoke about previously. But also, we kind of came into existence at a point in time where polarization has just kept getting more and more extreme. And I have to say, I don't think it's as bad now as it was in, say, 2020. Uh, I think it was really bad then, and I see evidence now that people are more tolerant, at least to a certain degree, at least in our circles, I think, uh, to hear a differing viewpoint. I think you, you could, I think today, if people were starting up a whole defund the police campaign, um, people would be a little more uh, uh, flexible to hearing somebody say that they don't think that's a that that's a, a viable strategy without entirely melting down and, and canceling them. But uh, I think, you know, the polarization problem is still extreme and still we can see the repercussions of that and we can st see the uh, the negative side effects through everything that we do to the point now where people don't seem to care whether they're being lied to by the politicians they support. Uh, any crime is justified because the other guy is worse. And we've seen conspiracy theories, I think, get exponentially stupider also. Uh, I feel like before this kind of rigid polarization, there was at least some kind of uh, motivation for people to at least give the appearance of showing evidence for claims. And now people don't even do that. You know, there's there's a whole book about that kind of migration into just the, the post-fact world uh, that was called, some people are saying, that uh, refers to that kind of rhetorical tactic where you say, well, some people are saying this, regardless of whether anybody actually is, you've suddenly thrown out a claim that people just take at face value because it's there. And I feel like we see so much of that now. And I've been thinking about ways to mitigate that because I've, I've seen that be a problem within our organization as well. We get people in and, you know, despite our best intentions of having a diverse kind of community where people are safe to discuss even what might be considered dangerous ideas and kind of hash these things out through an open dialogue, We've seen people get very dogmatic about their political viewpoints. We've seen people get really pissed off uh, at me in particular if I won't uh, dictate their exact values to the rest of the organization, demand that that's what the organization is, then we must be entirely on the other side. And I think it's just gotten too dramatically polarized and radical that the only thing we can really do is start at home. You know, we have to set an example for people. We have to engage people better in dialogues. We have to be willing on our end to hear what people are saying before we can expect them to listen to us. We need to act as kind of uh, uh, adult arbiters in conversations within our own organization, too. We can't demand 100% consensus on all things. We have to realize that people need a good deal of room to grow sometimes. 
or that we ourselves can be wrong about things and they can teach us those things. And if you don't give people that kind of space, they are going to end up on the other side. And if you don't have that humility to realize that you could be wrong, you're most likely going to end up being very wrong on something and make a complete fool of yourself. And I think that's 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 where I think that's where that's how I think we should all be trying to address that problem is in how we respond before we before we start demanding that uh, the other side be more reasonable and rational. We need to be able to demonstrate that we actually can do that ourselves. Yeah, there was an article in the Atlantic that highlighted or pretty in in depth about the uh, the kind of, I think they call it like a scandal in the Satanic Temple where people in your organization were kind of, kind of going after you. And I thought that you handled that so well. And I mean, you just basically articulated that. But in my experience, I grew up very religious conservative and then moved to California and then like, you know, not so religious anymore and not so uh, not so conservative. And I think that like having life experience and just seeing life from two perspectives. I remember being, you know, pro-life and, and et cetera. Like, I just remember holding those views in my brain and like, I wasn't a bad person there. I just saw the world kind of differently. I think that like, if people just had slightly more life experience and I like to tell people just move, like move to a different state. If you live in New York, go to Alabama for five years and like live amongst people. I think that that's the best thing that people can do exactly. to like break the spell. Sanctimonious motherfuckers are just really flexing a privilege of their own that they don't recognize. They grew up at the right place at the right time with the parents who were able to instill in them the the popular morals, and they you know they never had to necessarily undercome overcome uh, bad upbringing, bad teaching, bad experiences that led them in the bad in, a, in the wrong direction. And it, it does uh, irritate me to see people sometimes just denigrating and trying to destroy somebody who genuinely might have a misunderstanding of the facts that would change their entire moral perception. Because sometimes it really is true that people base their moral views based on what they think are the facts around them. Witch hunters of the days of yore, they thought at least some of them surely did think that by incantations or other such practices that there were people who were destroying their crops and causing plagues or causing uh, people to miscarry their, their babies or whatever. And uh, heightened scientific understanding of the world disabused them of that. But if you think those things are true, it's rational to burn somebody at the stake. Yeah, and you can totally. believe Some things are true that can lead you to do very horrific things that you absolutely would not do if you thought the facts were different. And so we really do have an obligation to really try to make sure that our opposition aren't just moral monsters and maybe they really do have a misunderstanding. I think one of the best illustrations of that is to consider the problem or what was perceived to be uh, uh, the problem that would be the, the most destructive problem of our day was overpopulation. And, uh, and uh, the scientist Ehrlich wrote the, the population bomb in the 70s, I believe. And, you know, he thought that by now we would have it's too much of an overpopulation problem to feed people correctly and that, you know, we would all die because of the fact that we had too many people on the planet to begin with. If you believe that, well, what's the moral thing to do? That brings up all kinds of troubling questions. <laughs> like, if you're going to start, if you think you need to engage in population control, I can't think of a way that would be considered entirely humane for anybody to do that. It, it all brings up trouble. And it turns out that overpopulation isn't an issue. People started realizing, no, the birth rates are going down. We can, can, and we can see that trends are likely to continue, that birth rates will continue going down, and that the real problem is going to be you know, sustaining a growth economy with a dwindling population. 
China tried to mitigate the problem of overpopulation by limiting people to one baby. And if you think about that not too hard, you're going to think, well, that sounds reasonable enough, right? What, what harm could there be? There was actually a documentary about the one-child policy and how that played out in China and how horrific that was. People were trying to hide that they were pregnant. They would have to discard babies after having them, and they were talking about you know, piles of dead babies in places and just the, the overall horrors of trying to regulate reproduction like that and what that led to. And it came from that position of being misinformed on what the facts are. And I really do get pissed off too when people take a question like that and refuse to really engage with the answer. This happened to Sam Harris. When Sam Harris was talking about torture and whether it was ever okay to torture somebody, and he presented the scenario where it was, say you have a terrorist and they know where a nuclear warhead is. It's gonna go off within you know, a couple hours or whatever, and you could potentially disable this thing. Only this guy knows the answer. And I think the kind of answer he came up with is that, yeah, if torture seems to get the answer out of somebody in that, in that kind of situation, you probably have to do whatever you need to do but also torture should be illegal because those are such extreme circumstances that people are probably going to violate those norms regardless of whether it's legal or not in that kind of situation anyways. And you may agree or disagree with his answer, but what I entirely disagree with is how so many people jumped onto the, those comments he made and simply framed it as Sam Harris is pro-torture and Sam Harris is an ass. I remember this. Yeah. They, I thought they were obligated to, all right, take, they were obligated to take that question and answer it honestly. Now you have to take the hypothetical, what do you do? There's a nuclear warhead. And, you know, just saying you won't engage with the question isn't enough, I think, if you're going to start uh, screaming that Sam Harris is just this, uh, is just this right-wing torture, pro-torture guy. But, uh I think that's how people like to handle those kinds of difficult questions. They they like to ignore the question and uh, and then uh, kill the messenger. Yeah, such good examples. I mean, especially about overpopulation. That's that's an example where I specifically changed my mind on that in the, like like the last ten years because I used change. to be and yeah I was, I was totally as a person, but it definitely changes how you how you think uh, an appropriate uh, social structure is is constructed at that point. I mean, there, there's a lot of ramifications to those kinds of beliefs. So facts are important. And facts, a lot of times, need to be removed from people's morality. And it is really dangerous when you have tribalized polarization where people don't care about facts but care more about tribal signaling. And that's when you do start getting people who are really espousing horrific beliefs, and it seems more just based on having turned into horrific people <laughs> rather than trying to solve a real-world problem. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So a couple of questions left uh, in the last few minutes here. I'm going to bring it back a little bit down to terrestrial politics since we are coming up on election season. Do you think that there's ever going to be a satanic, like an openly satanic politician in America? Or are there any? I'm not aware of any, but there's plenty of Christians, plenty of Christians out there. Well, there's a uh, there was a congressional candidate in California, Steve Hill, who's run. Uh, he's running now and he's run a couple times before as a Satanist candidate as the the black Satanist candidate in California, who's not going to win a seat probably, but you know he'll get double digits. He he does he does good enough, and uh, it's it's nice to see him fight that fight. I uh, I think we will honestly. I we've grown so much in ten years that I think people don't realize what we've done to the very concept of Satanism. We did this 10 years ago. I was really horrified to have my face on anything and didn't really have the optimism to expect that we would have the kind of core support that we do now in that we actually have op-ed pieces being written in our favor and things like that. I mean, to me, that was unimaginable before what we did. And I think we did so much quick work in so much very 
uh, dedicated and focused work that, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, that, that, that kind of change has taken place. And I think it'll only continue. I think now that we really are leveraging our position and we have had presence, a presence in schools, I think we're just going to see a, a difference in generations too. I remember when I first started this, I would do lectures and I would speak to audiences of mostly older people who would be, you know, very perplexed sometimes. Some of them would be pissed. A lot of them would challenge me during the Q&A. And I remember the first time I went out and spoke to a group of undergraduates, I was expecting the same kind of haranguing and, and anger and everything in the crowd. And I was telling them everything about the Satanic Temple, what we were doing, what we were planning on doing. And it was just a whole audience of people just nodding their heads and saying, that sounds cool. You know, and I thought, damn, there is a real generation difference there. And I think there's going to be a B1, uh, uh, you know, a severe distinction in, in the generation gap when it comes to concepts of Satanism. Because, you know, people my age remember the Satanic Panic. And, you know, undergrads now, to them, that's that's still far in the past. That's itself a type of mythology. So for a lot of people, their real introduction into what they think of Satanism at all comes from the Satanic Temple. Mm -hmm. And some people are very motivated by our ethical standing on things and some of the things that we have done publicly. And they're going into law school. They're going into they have political aspirations and we hear from them. And I think after after a while, that's that's going to that's just going to be internalized in our culture for, okay. for better or worse, for better in my mind, but for the worst in in some people's. Yeah, I got to say that the uh, that movie Hail Satan with a question mark uh, by Penny Lane was such a good I know it wasn't meant to be this necessarily, but it was such a good PR thing for the Satanic Temple. That movie is, is so fascinating. And it it it. it I'm sure it brought a lot of people on board, but it made me excited about the Satanic Temple, personally. Yeah. Um, one last question here, which is that, what is your vision for America? Where would you like the country to go? You have a lot of different campaigns that you're working on, everything from, again, you know, after-school programs for kids to the Samuel Little's mom's abortion clinic. To, there, there's a lot going on with you guys. What what would you like to, where's, what's the direction would you like to see the country move? Do you think that it will? And where do you think we're going to be in five or 10 years? You know, I, I, my power to predict, I think, is nil at this point. Uh, it, 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 so much is up in the air. It's it's really unpredictable. I think this next election is going is a very meaningful one for sure. Um, whether or not we manage to mitigate some of the problems we have in the uh, four years after this next election, uh, in ways we didn't this time. I, I feel like there's a lot of things we're facing in this upcoming election that uh, should have been challenged much more severely <laughs> before before we got to this point. Uh, whether we'll we'll break the the bondage of our two party system anytime soon, I don't know, but I really hope so. But I just I do think that the polarization we're experiencing is a a primary problem. I think it's it's something that uh, that can't be overstated and really needs everybody on board. I think we have to stop uh, expecting other people to solve our problems for us. We have to stop looking at this as though we're not involved as like these detached academics just watching it unfold and blaming everybody else for our own stupidity. Uh, as I was saying, like we, we all have to take ownership of the depolarization and show that we're willing to speak with other people. I think we all need to kind of adjust our online behavior to be more dignified and approach things in a more rational manner. And also make sure that we're not just glomming on to misinformation because it's telling a story we like to hear or because it was uh, retweeted or reposted by somebody we respect or want to be friends with or taking people's grandstanding comments as uh, as as some kind of uh, noble declaration, even though we know it doesn't align with the facts. We, we need to start being more responsible as people. And I think 
people who are really concerned about the theocratic overthrow uh, need to realize that oftentimes the opposition to that has been perfectly fine resigning themselves to being the victims with the victim status in our culture and almost uh, almost happy, it seems, when there's another affront against our values and beliefs because it, it further entrenches them in that position. We need to start doing what the opposition is doing. We need people representing us in politics. And to that end, you know, a vision for America, in my mind, is still democratic. I, I know we've seen people identifying with the left, whatever that even is supposed to mean now, uh, talking about the democratic system itself being tainted by white Western values and needing to be entirely dismantled. I disagree. It's still the best system we got. It's still the one most aligned with the epistemology of science, I think, because it does demand pluralism. It does demand diversity. It does do its best for that aspirational goal of an equal say amongst people and equal treatment. And it does, I think, at best, leave the kind of terrain of the mental environment open to all kinds of different viewpoints in a, in a uh, environment of free speech and free expression. And so I think those are all well worth preserving. Those are the things we're fighting to preserve. And I think it's just a huge mistake to say, America has always been what the theocrats are claiming that it has been and that they're trying to turn it into, because then we just give up the fight. You know, if if my vision of what this should be is aspirational and it has never been quite that, I think it was at least the aspirational goal for some time and is still an aspirational goal worth having and pursuing. Great. Well, that's a perfect place to end it. Thank you for coming on the show. That was a lot of fun and a lot of important things you guys are doing. I'll be on the lookout for you guys. Great. Thank you so much.